Great, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Laura Hughes and I'm a principal with EHT Traceries. Uh, we prepared two uh, landmark nominations for DCPL to document LGBTQ resources in Washington, DC. Um, these nominations actually were recommendations from the historic context study that was published in 2019. Um, the context study suggested for the slow borough house that um, it was potentially eligible under national register criterion A and B. Um, and that's sort of how we proceeded with the nomination um, as we began our research and documentation. Um, criterion A in this case, um, they thought, the historic context thought um, that it could be significant as a representation of um, Slow Burl's um, arrangement um, in terms of their um, living at the house on Kearney Street um, in a very quiet manner um, and um, that they really shied away from a more public um, display of their relationship. And then of course, um, Criterion B for its association with Lucy, Lucy Slow and uh, Mary Burrell, um, two African-American women whose association um, with Howard University and the Harlem Renaissance was very significant. Um, and so with that, we proceeded with the nomination and I'm actually going to turn it over to Catherine Wallace who will um, really give the bulk of the presentation. And um, Eric Griffiths is also here from Traceries as well to answer any questions that we have at the end. Thank you, Laura. Um, my name is Catherine Wallace. I'm a senior architectural historian with EHT Traceries and my colleague Eric and I worked on this report it's already been two years ago, and so we conducted a site visit together and then authored this nomination. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my PowerPoint. So the house at 1256 Kearney Street is located in the heart of Brooklyn between Michigan Avenue and Rhode Island near the intersection of Kearney and 13th Streets Northeast. The Basilica is located just to the Northwest and Catholic University is to the North. A permit was first issued for construction of the building in 1890 to Irish immigrant James T. Ward and his wife, Hannah. The Wards owned lots three and four and the house was built on lot three and it was likely completed in 1893. The wards resided in the two-story house until 1918, when they sold it to salesman bookkeeper William E. Gordon and his wife, Mary. The subsequent occupants from 1922 to 1937 were African-American couple Lucy Diggs Slow and Mary Powell Burrill. These influential women had met 10 years prior <clears throat> in 1912 through their shared work as educators. In 1918, the women moved in together and engaged in a domestic partnership that would continue for the next 25 years until Slow's death in 1937. The current owners of the home are Ben and Don O'Connell, who acquired the house in 2004. I'll first introduce you to Lucy Diggs Slow, a woman of many accomplishments and one of the foremost women involved in the field of African-American education in the early 20th century in Washington, DC. Slow was second in her class at Baltimore Colored High School, and she was the first female from the school to enroll at Howard University. In 1908, Slow earned her Bachelor of Arts in English from Howard University. While she was a student, she was one of nine original founders of the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. She drafted much of its constitution and served as their first vice president. She was also honored as Howard University class valedictorian. She went on to earn her master's degree from Columbia Graduate School of Arts and Sciences in 1915. She also took classes at Columbia University Teachers College where she studied student personnel. Incredibly, Slow also found the time to compete as a professional tennis player. 
When she was a student at Howard, she faced very restricted hours of allowed practice time, but became a talented player nonetheless and was elected president of the Women's Tennis Club. Graduating from Howard in 1908, it would be another nine years until Lucy won the American Tennis Association's first ever tournament in 1917 which likely made her the first African-American woman to win a major sports title in any sport. Slow continued dominating on the court, winning multiple championships in both singles and doubles events in tournaments in Philadelphia to New York. At the age of 39, she finally retired from competitive tennis, having won 17 championships in all. But Slow is best remembered for her professional contributions to African-American and women's education. She first accepted a position teaching English at Douglas High School in Baltimore before moving to Washington, DC in 1915 to teach at Armstrong High School, one of DC's three black high schools at the time. Not long after, in 1919, the District of Columbia was so impressed with her teaching abilities that Slow was tasked with the creation of the first public junior high school for African Americans, the Robert Goldshaw Junior High School at 7th and Rhode Island Northeast. She served as school principal there until 1922, when she was hired to the Howard University English Department and also hired as Howard's first Dean of Women. She was the first African American woman to hold this position nationally. During her tenure at Howard, Slow supported expanding educational opportunities for women students. She helped introduce curriculum changes and persuaded female students to pursue non-traditional careers outside of education or nursing, which were the fields of study most common for women at the time. She instead encouraged women to study science and mathematics and pushed for diversified academic opportunities. Slow is also credited with the creation of a dedicated women's dormitory area, which remains in use on Howard's campus today. Additionally, she's known to have spearheaded the freshman orientation program to better assist students with their tradition transition to college life. Slow did meet obstacles while at Howard, particularly from Howard University's new president, Mordecai Johnson. Johnson ultimately had her removed from the Board of Deans. He ensured that her salary was lower than all other deans and took steps to reduce resources available to women students. But Slow did work outside of Howard U University as well. She founded the National Association of College Women, the Association of Advisors to Women in Colored Schools, and the National Council of Negro Women. She was also active in the Young Women's Christian Association and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Her many professional accomplishments are highlighted in more detail in the book, Faithful to the Task at Hand by Miller and Pruitt Logan. Slow passed away in 1937 of kidney failure. There is a building in LaJoy Park named in her honor, which became a Howard dorm after World War II. There's also a stained glass window panel in Howard's Rankin Chapel. Slow was well-respected and her death was considered a great loss to the university and all of those who knew her. A historic landmark marker has been placed at Slow's birthplace in Berryville, Virginia. Also, curiously, DC Water named a boring machine after her during the First Street Water Project. It has been determined that the 1256 Kearney Street House is the property that best commemorates the life of Lucy Diggs Slow and her contributions to African American and women's education. Slow only lived for very short periods of time at T Street and K Street circa 1918. And although Howard President Mordecai Johnson pushed for Slow to live on campus while she was a dean, as he believed was appropriate for a dean of women, Slow refused, saying she was not just a house matron. 
Slow pointed out that male deans had no requirement to live on campus, and she fought for her right to live off campus, where and with whom she pleased. While living at Kearney Street through the peak of her career, Slow counseled many of her students and hosted student gatherings. By bringing her work home with her and inviting students into her personal life, she was practicing her philosophy of the role of a truly modern dean. Mary Powell Burrill was born in Washington, DC and graduated in 1901 from M Street High School, which in 1916 became Dunbar High School. In 1904, Burrill became one of the first African-Americans to earn a diploma from Emerson College. She went on to become a respected educator, playwright, and poet. Burrill had an illustrious teaching career working at DC Armstrong's Manual High, and then as the director of the Washington Conservatory of Music's School of Expression. But most of her teaching career took place at her alma mater, the M Street School, where she taught until her retirement in 1944. Burrill taught English, speech, and drama, and also enjoyed directing plays and musical productions. Many of her high school students went on to become ed educators, writers, and playwrights themselves. Her student, Willis Richardson, became the first African-American dramatist to have a play produced on Broadway. When she wasn't teaching, Burrill worked as a playwright herself and regularly attended Georgia Douglas Johnson's S Street Salon, a weekly gathering of black writers. Burrill was particularly active in the years preceding the Harlem Renaissance, a period termed the New Negro Renaissance. She is best known for her one act plays, Aftermath and They That Sit in Darkness, both of which were published in 1919. Many consider her plays to be protest plays because of their progressive nature and emphasis on issues of race and gender. They That Sit in Darkness was published in Margaret Sanger's Birth Control Review, a monthly publication advocating for reproductive rights for women. The play focuses on the difficulties faced by working class Black families with numerous children, including challenges accessing birth control. Aftermath was published in The Liberator, edited by socialist Max Eastman. The main character in this play, John, was an African-American male who selflessly and fearlessly confronted racial oppression. In 1922, when Slow was first appointed Dean of Women at Howard, the two women decided to move to Kearney Street in the Brooklyn neighborhood. During the early 20th century, Brooklyn increasingly attracted affluent African Americans because it did not have the racially restrictive covenants characteristic of other affluent neighborhoods. Over the 15 years of their occupancy on Kearney Street, Lucy Slow and Mary Burrill hosted parties and intellectual gatherings attended by female Howard students and prominent writers and artists, including the poet Jean Toomer, poet and playwright Georgia Douglas Johnson, an educator and civil rights activist, Mary McLeod Bethune. As a member of the Dubois Circle, a literary group, Slow also likely hosted discussions about current events and the arts at her home. For Howard's female students, the Kearney Street home became a refuge where Slow counseled and encouraged them in the shade of the trees in the backyard or gathered around the fire in the living room. I'll also add here that while Slow and Burrill never publicly stated that they were romantically involved, they did share their lives for more than two decades. And at the time, the women's rights movement was growing. Society still retained a generally conservative view regarding alternative lifestyles, particularly in regard to same-sex female couples. This resulted in many gay and lesbian couples keeping their personal relationships either entirely hidden or mainly out of public view. Because Slow and Burrill were private, they escaped significant public scrutiny that could have impacted their social standing and their careers.
The Queen Anne House at 1256 Kearney Street does retain historic integrity to the period of significance, which is the period Slow and Beryl occupied the house. Notable features include the cross gable roof, asymmetrical massing, front porch with Tuscan columns and bay windows. There are additions, but they're not highly visible from the street. Here you can see the lot boundaries, which they're inclusive of all of lot three, which includes the Queen Anne dwelling and the large yard where Slow and Beryl entertain their guests. I will now hand it over to uh, Laura to talk about the significance evaluation and some of the challenges we had with this nomination. Thanks very much, Sarah. Uh, I mean, Catherine. Um, so ultimately, um, the landmark nomination was designated in April of 2020. Um, and there was some lag between um, that designation and the National Register designation. Um, the National Register had uh, several, several questions about the nomination, particularly the criteria that were being used. Um, and so ultimately for the DC nomination, um, it was designated under criterion C for its association with the productive life of educator Lucy Slow, um, who was significant to the history of the District of Columbia and the nation. Um, and similarly, um, the National Register nomination ultimately designated um, the nomination under criterion B with the same association with Lucy Slow. Um, and so, um, Catherine, can you just, yeah, thank you. Um, and these were some of the National Register comments um, on the nomination and the use of criterion A um, with its association with the LGBTQ history. Um, and so um, I think as Catherine mentioned throughout her presentation, um, there are challenges with designating these resources um, because um, people who were um, living in the LGBT community at this time um, really um, tended to be um, very quiet about their lifestyle um, and they tended to be very sheltered in their um, residences. Um, and so um, ultimately um, the National Register um, did not think there was a significant link between Slow and Burles presumed same-sex relationship um, and their professional achievements. Um, the two women were certainly um, very esteemed in terms of their educational and professional careers, um, but they um, did not think that their association with LGBTQ history um, was strong enough. Um, and likely that was intentional. Um, they did not, um, complete any writings or attend protests or really promote their ideas. Um, and so the designation, while all of this is still documented in the designation, it was not one of the criteria that was used. And I think we're ready to uh, answer any questions anyone has. Okay, so we have a question from Nancy in the chat. Uh, do we know what obstacles the couple faced in purchasing the home, given that they were black women? In our research, we didn't come across any obstacles that they had purchasing the home. As I mentioned, Brooklyn would have been uh, an easier place for them to have purchased a home. There might be more in the book that I mentioned, um, Faithful to the Task at Hand, but in our extensive research, we don't believe that they came, came up against obstacles in that regard. Um, so Craig asks, there is a school in Brooklyn named after Slow. How and when did that happen? Let me check on that one. <laughs> It's an elementary school, um, but I don't recall the date. Let me just 
check on that. If there are other questions, yeah. you all are welcome to carry on. I think we we say in the nomination, I just don't recall the date. Um, Sarah Schoenfeld, I'm probably allowed to speak. She mentions um, that the school was completed in 1948. Okay, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just I'll, I'll just add about um, you know as far as you know Lucy Slow and 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 Burl they were um, they were they were pretty well known in the neighborhood the Brooklyn neighborhood um, and that includes so it's not surprising that Brooklyn would have named a school after her uh, considering the fact she was a very prominent. Um, resident and and her connections with Howard. I mean, we were even when we were at the site talking with the owners, they people from Howard University still today will they told us uh come to the house to 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 see where Lucy Slow lived. And this is some, you know, what is it, some 70 years after her death. So I mean she's a pretty well known figure in in you know sort of Howard circles and as well Brooklyn circles as well. I believe it's part of the sorority's introduction to its new members to do a historical tour of Howard and other important sites in DC. And of course, as the founder, Lucy Slow Residence is one of the stops on that um, sorority tour. Um, so follow-up question from Craig. Um, he says, were they ever um, kind of in quotes, accused of having a romantic relationship or did people have an idea that they were um, during the time, I guess? I mean, I think um, there was always, um, you know, a feeling that they did have a relationship. Um, Burrell previously had had um, a same-sex relationship with someone else prior to meeting Lucy. Um, so, um, I think there was always that um, uh, sensation around them, um, but they never commented on it publicly or um, really spoke about it openly. And, and the reason why we know that Burrell had a previous relationship is that um, her love letters with that relationship yeah. have been found. And that's not the case with Lucy Slow. I mean, she obviously, I don't know, those letters have either been lost or she purposely destroyed them, so. And the previous relationship uh, they are referencing was with the American journalist, Angelina Weld Grimke. Um, so Sarah asked, uh, she said, sorry if this was discussed already, I came in late, um, but why was the site chosen as an LGBTQ site uh, and were there, no other good options, I guess. Um, um, the site was chosen. It was actually one of the recommendations from the LGBTQ um, historic context that was prepared in 2019. Um, and there were a number of um, sites that were recommended. Um, Annie's Paramount Steakhouse was the other site that we prepared a nomination for. Um, and that similarly has been designated. Um, so I think um, these two uh, both were supported by their owners, um, so that that made them um, sort of excellent candidates for nomination. Um, I think there have been some challenges because um, some owners of other resources that were recommended did not want to be designated. But that's not to say these two will be the only ones that will come out of that historic context. I think certainly the intention is to nominate several other um, resources. 
Um, a question from Judith. Uh, do they both own the home or are both their names, I guess, on the. <laughs> I believe it was slow who was on the paperwork, but they lived there together for the duration of that period of ownership. Um, so Susan asked. Uh, do the presenters have a sense of how, according to the National Park Service comments, a person might be significant to LGBTQ history for a reason other than political activism? It seems like NPS might be taking a pretty narrow view of LGBTQ history. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with that. Um, I think, um, but certainly, I mean, I think they've designated quite a few LGBTQ resources uh, recently. Um, Maryland also just recently prepared a historic context with recommendations um, for individual resources to be designated. So um, I think uh, they're just being very cautious um, about the criteria that's being used. Um, and in this instance, I think in their opinion, um, there was no hard evidence to say that they were in um, a romantic same-sex relationship. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Nancy asks in the chat, can you talk more about the differences between DC's historic designation versus national registers? Uh, what does that mean for the homeowner in practical terms? Um, well, the um, DC designation is um, where um, that would trigger a review of any changes to the exterior of the property. Um, and the National Register nomination is uh, strictly um, an honorific designation. Um. We have somebody here, um, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, Jenny. Um, they mention, um, I, write extent, I wrote extensively about the relationship in my book, A Queer Capital. Um, it is pretty clear that they sought to prevent the relationship from being known. For example, they were a couple before moving in together, but there were apparently no surviving letters between them. And Slow told Howard that they lived together for financial reasons. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, all their friends and colleagues treated them as a couple. And if I remember correctly, um, I was looking through, I think the nomination or I was reading about them in my own time after Lucy died, didn't Mary kind of take on the role of like, like a traditionally like um, a spouse in a, in, in a marriage after she died, um, kind of taking on that role um, in the process of kind of you know, getting her funeral together. I think if I remember correctly. She was the one solely responsible for managing her estate and corresponding with other loved ones of uh, Lucy's. And uh, yes, the commenter is right that they um, weren't public about their relationship, particularly at, at Howard. And it's a theory that it was, it's one of the reasons why Howard President Mordecai Johnson was pushing for her to live on campus. It's a theory that he wasn't supportive of her lifestyle off campus and knew of her relationship with Burrell. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, sorry. There's like a conversation in the Q&A box. <laughs> um, guys, uh, the Q&A box is for questions, but you're more than welcome to have like discussions in the chat. I know it's kind of confusing, but um, <laughs> I'm like reading a, an interesting discussion in the, in the Q&A. Um, so Sarah asks, was the nomination revised to say more about Slow and her leadership of AKA after the NPS rejected the LGBTQ history? as a relevant criterion for designation. Were there any revisions, I guess? There were some revisions um, to reflect the um, MPS comments um, and um, DCPO and traceries and um, the DC Preservation Office um, worked on those revisions. And then the nomination was subsequently resubmitted and um, then uh, it was listed in the National Register. Mm -hmm. Um, let me 
Uh, let's see, let's see. A couple of more questions. Um, the, the letter uh, between possibly uh, Mary and um, Grinke, sorry, I forgot her first name. Uh, that is uh, cited in the nomination, correct? Um, I believe, I think, or if we have, maybe. We have a, a question about whether it was between them or maybe possibly somebody else, but I'm pretty sure that's a cited source in the nomination, right? Um, from Jenny. Uh, Catherine, is it in the nomination? No, it's already been a, been a while. I believe we discussed uh, Mary's relationship with Angelina in the nomination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Recall to what extent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So definitely refer refer to that in nomination. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. I believe that relationship was discovered by one woman or the other's parents and was with disapproval and um, maybe that was the reason why Mary and Lucy were more private in their relationship. Yeah. Um, did you uh, happen to work with the Rainbow History Project? I think I saw in the nomination there were quite a few resources from their collection used for this. I mean, it certainly was a resource that we use throughout the nomination process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a great study as well as the historic context, the 2019 historic context. Yeah. Um, let's see, any other questions for, uh, from folks? Again, you know, um, if there's any like follow-up questions following this, I'll let me check and see if there's any on Facebook. If there's any uh, follow-up questions following this presentation, you're always more than welcome to email us. Like I said, at info at dcpreservation.org. Um, and we can pass them along to our wonderful speakers here today and they can kind of let me know what the answer is and I can get back to you. Um, but let me double check Facebook, I think. Nope, nothing on Facebook. Let me double check and see if we got everybody's questions. Um, maybe this is something that you all know. Uh, we just got a question from Susan. Uh, was Slow friends with Elaine Locke, who was at Howard at the same time? I can't say that I came across that name, but I'm sure the books that are uh, focused on slow might include more information, but I can't say one way or the other. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I think that is all the questions that we have right now. But I will be on the lookout for any follow-up questions that folks might have following the presentation. Um, so with that, I guess we'll we'll close it out. Um, is there anything that maybe the EHT Traceries team wants to share with folks, maybe about future projects or things we should look out for in the future? Um, I'm going to share your website and uh, social media in the chat now. Um, in case there's anything coming up. 
Great. Well, um, yeah, just uh, look at our website for um, our, our most recent projects. And um, uh, we're happy to answer any questions if anyone has additional questions after the presentation. Um, and I'm also going to put in the chat right now uh, the nomination that Tracery's wrote for the Slow Borough House. Um, I also have a link to the LGBTQ Historic Context Study. Um, I encourage you all to take a look at these resources. Um, they're, it's wonderful to learn more about Lucy and Slow through the, through the nomination and then also the context study to kind of get an idea of what exactly the themes were that were looked at, um, get an idea of other places that were um, identified. It's a really great resource. And I also made a note of the National Park Service underrepresented uh, community grants program, uh, which underwrote the context study. Um, and, you know, as we're talking about, okay, um, the criteria from the NPS, kind of like these challenges that are, we're facing with getting sites like this designated, um, I think it's really important to look at those um, community grants because, you know, they're, lead, they're helping that effort of creating a more inclusive and, and diverse um, National Registrar NDC inventory. So, make a note of that. Um, and I just want to thank our wonderful uh, presenters today and thank you for all of your work um, with this nomination and other projects that you all are working on and have worked on. Um, it's, it's, it's really important work and it's, it's just really amazing when we can get sites like this designated and, and protected for, um, for future, the future of DC, DC and communities and, and all this stuff. I'm, I'm kind of rambling, but uh, I just want to say we do, we do appreciate your work and it, it is wonderful. Um, yeah, so thank you all again for joining us for today's program. Again, special thank you to our presenters. I also want to thank Jess for her, her help on Facebook today. Um, again, if you have any additional questions or comments or anything, please email us at info at dcpreservation.org. Um, I will put that in the chat now. So you have it. And again, I encourage you to take a look at the Traceries website uh, and learn more about them and follow them on social media. Um, so thank you all again. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you again to Traceries and we look forward to seeing you all at future DCPL programs. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa.